Greetings, ladies and mantle gents, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from Outer of space. space. And as always, I hope that you enjoy. Story number one. Backwater, written by Hena. The air was dry. Everything was covered in dust. And every once in a while, you could catch a strong whiff of crap, probably wafting in from the fields on the outskirts of town. Prefab houses huddled together around the main roads, seeming to hold on to the barely maintained appearance with a vice-like grip. The people didn't trust you if you were new, and the concept of justice was applied rather loosely. All in all, it reminded me a bit of home, an amusing coincidence considering I would be calling this little backwater town home for the foreseeable future. I pushed through the cheap prefab door, of the local watering hole, letting out fresh wave of cool air. As I entered the taproom, I looked down the hood of my worn leather coat and surveyed the inhabitants. I wasn't entirely surprised at what I found. Your usual collection of layabouts, a handful of farmers, and a small group of men who probably made a living preying on the hard work of others. I let a small grin drift onto my face. Bearing a few teeth. I meandered over to the bar and planted myself in an empty seat before the barkeep wandered over. I'll be human, the barkeep was gruff, hulking brucker, seven feet of hard, leathery skin and muscle, complete with various shades of green. They could usually be found as guns for hire just about anywhere in the galaxy. This one was bent with age and bore the scars of battles long past. I shrugged, and a fine film of dust that had collected on the road drifted from my shoulders. The hard stuff, if you've got it. Neat. Hard stuff generally refer to anything over 25% alcohol by volume, but you could buy anywhere up to 50% without a permit. Unless you happen to live in Hubert Spacer. We liked our hard stuff pretty damn hard. Of course, the likelihood of me finding the good stuff out here would be slim to none, and would be horribly overpriced. The barkeep presented me with a bottle as though it was a prized possession, and not booze. I had to fight back a laugh as the bottle presented to me was from an old distillery. Jack Daniels. That had been bought so many times that it was hard to keep track. Not exactly something I would drink neat, but I doubt they carry cola at ya, either. Still, it made me wonder how something like that managed to get all the way out here into the arse end of the Orion Arm. The barkeep poured me a hefty portion, and it went down easy enough. Can't complain, I suppose. I see you're enjoying the good stuff spoke a sinuous voice from my right in barely intelligible common. I looked over to find a reddish brown A leaning against the bar. Damned snake people. If there's somewhere with organized crime, you can find a A. They were generally the dexterous members of the organization, handling the quick and dirty type jobs involving breaking locks, cracking security codes, and things like that. I placed my hand on my thigh, a hair's breadth away from my handgun. I'm not racist, but you know, of course, wherever you can find a shifty-looking sl- I, you can find a- Heavy hand slapped onto the bar to my left, causing several glasses to tumble over. But we usually save the good stuff for important people, said the intimidating creature beside me. Well, he would have been intimidating if it weren't for the Xeno equivalent of a beer gut- hang over the alien's belt. Judging by the stocky build and bad breath and beady eyes, this was a mon, and you could find one everywhere you could find a shifty-looking sli-eye. Lebron to the sli-eye's brain. Bipedal, heavy set, they looked scary, but they had plenty of weaknesses. And filthy humans don't count as important out here continued the snake. I might not be racist, but it became more common the further down the arm you traveled. Generally, folk didn't like humans too much. Not a problem unless they made it a problem, usually. The pair seemed eager 
to make it a problem, though. Want me to spin it back up, then? I asked, adding a bit of backwater drawl to my common. Thank you, pale skin, grumbled the mon. Only if you buy me another drink, Chubbs. And uh, who do you think you are, the snake said, that you can talk to us that way? I merely gestured for the bartender to pour another drink. The mon to my right roared and began to take a swing at me. Now, they're big, stocky creatures that throw around a lot of weight. Weight that needs to be supported on two legs. So when I drew my handgun, possibly an understatement, and blew one thick leg apart at the kneecap, the mon dropped like a sack of bricks. With my left hand still on the bar, I gripped my glass and chucked it blindly to my right. I was rewarded with a meaty smack, followed shortly by breaking glass. I asked my handgun, stood up, and broke my cheap barstool over the slave's head. I towered over the fallen snake and calmly pulled aside my coat with one hand, then tapped the fancy hologram that served as a badge. I'm your new sheriff, Scaly. Get used to it. End of story. Story number two. For want of a rivet, a colony was formed. Written by Bond Rose. For want of a rivet, an engine was breached. For want of an engine, a ship was lost. For want of a ship, an advance was turned. For want of an advance, a planet was saved. For want of a planet, a siege was laid. This refrain is popular among humans because it highlights how they managed to take so many planets so quickly, and thus why they are a major force in the political landscape. It is common among species in the Republic that individuals are assigned jobs from birth. A drone groans crops, a soldier fights wars, a bureaucrat makes paperwork, a merchant sells goods, a lawyer robs you blind... Uh, sorry, um... Uh, still a bit bitter off uh, of my last wife. Uh, the humans, though, they have a different take on things. Uh, among humans, individuals are free to change jobs at any time. A lawyer may become a bureaucrat, a merchant may become an artist, and, uh, most importantly, a soldier may become a farmer. For a long time, it was a common tactic that, if you couldn't crush your opponent in battle over a planet, to let them take the planet, then enclose the planet in a shield to starve them out. As warships are notoriously bad environments for drones, you block off offenses by third parties so that they can't claim your prize in a few decades, when the shields are due to be opened and you are sure the soldiers on the planet were all dead. When the humans entered the Republic, they started taking as many planets as they could and were laughed at while stretching their forces thin. That is, they were laughed at until the shields were opened decades later and immediately resealed because they still had active soldiers inside. The cycle of opening and resealing happened many times before force sieging the planet realized that it wasn't an issue of an unusually long-lived soldier cast, but a breeding population and started doing orbital bombardment. Once the bombardment started occurring, humanity took their opponents to court, arguing that by right of homesteaders, the attackers were taking illegal actions against planets that had been successfully settled by full-spectrum populations for several generations. Because humans can switch jobs, they were able to have large portions of their population train both as soldiers and all of the necessary jobs for a new colony. All humans in their population can be low-rate breeders, so when trying, they can double their population once or twice before the next time the shield is lifted. Given several thousand soldiers landing on a planet and half a dozen shield cycles, and they'll have sufficient population as a low-speed breeder to claim homesteader rights. The basic premise runs like so. They have individuals from their population volunteer to be cross-trained as soldiers. Then, when they take a planet, they immediately start planting crops and building infrastructure so that they can outlast the siege. As the sieging force is fighting off any third parties, they don't have to worry about orbital defense except for the odd exploratory incursion every few decades. They keep their entire population on standby as soldiers, training up new generations to replace old ones. The population is required to keep up on their training, 
but they are also doing other jobs and having as many children as they can support. They fend off an attack whenever the shield is open, and after a few centuries, the planet is legally theirs. Your assignment for this week is to do a 20-page cost-benefit analysis on both the generalist and specialist methods of population employment in regards to settling planets. End of story. The algorithm reckons you should be watching this video next, and I recommend that you should be always watching my video. So, click and click with energy! And yes, clicking that does help the channel. Thank you very much. I just want to quickly thank the T5 channel members and patrons. The Lithia, Barky, Trigan95, Beauty Cure, Meridian117, Cam Maxwell, Casper Arnholt, Jordan Buxborn, Angry Marine, Albard and Gusta, Savage Patch Papa, and Arcadian. <laughs>